Christianity is the most practiced religion not only in Western nations, but the world. Likewise, the Christian deity known as the devil is probably one of the most feared in the world. The fear of this being is enough to shape a person's entire life, and this is especially tragic considering this malevolent entity never existed until the New Testament was written. It should be clarified that the story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden is not interpreted by all Christian theologians as being the devil. The existence of the devil is not directly implied until the New Testament, Revelation 12, 9, with the story of the fallen angel. According to scholars at the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, the original Hebrew text, which was located in the 14th chapter of the Old Testament book of Isaiah, was not about a fallen angel, but a fallen Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar, who during his life, persecuted the children of Israel. As to why a devil was created by the church, there are two theories, the first being to appease man's ego. Ego is the worst confidence trickster we could ever figure, we could ever imagine, because you don't see it. And the single biggest con is, I am you. The problem is that the ego hides in the last place that you'd ever look, within itself. It disguises its thoughts as your thoughts, its feelings as your feelings. It, y you think it's you. People's need to protect their own egos knows no bounds. They will lie, cheat, steal, kill, do whatever it takes to maintain what we call ego boundaries. People have no clue that they're in prison. They don't know that there is an ego. They don't know the distinction. At first it's difficult for the mind to accept that there's some something beyond itself, that there's something uh, of, of greater value and greater capacity for discerning truth than itself. In religion, the ego manifests as the devil. And of course, no one realizes how smart the ego is because it created the devil so you could blame someone else. In creating uh, this imaginary external enemy, we usually, usually made a, a real enemy for ourselves and that becomes a real danger to the ego, but that's also the ego's creation. There is no such thing as an external enemy, no matter what that voice in your head is telling you. All perception of an enemy is a projection of the ego as the enemy. In that sense, you could say that 100% of our external enemies are of our own creation. Your greatest enemy is your own inner perception, is your own ignorance, is your own ego. We've all heard different variations of the saying, the devil made me do it. The second theory is that it was to give the church more control over man. Now they had a threat to hold over the populace. There is no Hebrew word for devil, which is actually a translation of the Greek word diabolos, and the Hebrew word Satan means adversary or foe. The name Lucifer is actually Latin, and is another name for the goddess and planet, Venus, meaning light bringer or morning star. It did not make its debut as the name for the Christian devil until the King James Version of the Bible was written, and this was due to a misinterpretation of the Hebrew words Hillel Shetar which mean morning star, and is what the prophet Isaiah called the previously mentioned Babylonian king in the original text of the Old Testament. This misreading after the text was changed in the New Testament resulted in Venus' name later being attributed to the now fallen angel. Hell. Like the devil, the Christian principles of hell came into existence in the New Testament. Many myths and religions have some version of that which we now call hell, and in the Old Testament, it was referred to as Sheol, or a place of the dead, where there was no activity and everyone, whether good or bad, ended up eventually. Augustine of Hippo, who lived between November 354 and August 430, was a Christian theologian and philosopher. He was influential in developing Western Christianity, and helped to formulate the doctrine of original sin. Since Augustine's influence, Christians have believed that upon death their souls would be permitted to rest peacefully, while the damned would be subjected to torment until the resurrection. A new scientific approach. There are many who believe we need to start looking to science for our answers. According to futurist and theoretical physicist, Michio Kaku, there are different levels of civilization. A type 1 civilization has the power of an entire planet. They control the weather. They mine the oceans. 
They control volcanoes. They control earthquakes. Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, would be an example of a type one civilization, a planetary civilization in space. A type two civilization in space controls the output of a star. They play with stars. They are immortal. Nothing known to science can destroy a type two civilization. Ice ages can be modified. Meteors, comets can be deflected. Even the death of their sun is not a problem. They can either move their planet, reignite their star, or simply find a new star in space. This is a type two civilization. A typical example of a type two civilization comes from science fiction. The Federation of Planets, Star Trek, would be based on a typical type two civilization. And then we have type three. A type three civilization is galactic. They control the energy output of an entire star. For me, this is very interesting because a type three civilization would be able to control the Planck energy. The Planck energy is the energy at which space becomes unstable. Space begins to boil at the Planck energy. The Planck energy is a quadrillion times higher than the Large Hadron Collider. And gateways, perhaps, wormholes, doorways, portals, perhaps to other dimensions, begin to open up for a type three civilization. So we have type one, which is planetary, type two, which is stellar, and type three, which is galactic. What are we? Are we type one that control the power of a planet? Are we type two that control the power of a star? Are we type three that can control galaxies, alter the fabric of space and time? No, we are type zero. We get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. But take out a calculator. How long will it take for us to become type one? The answer is a hundred years. Around the year 2100, we will become a type one civilization. And we see the beginnings of that now. What is the internet? The internet is a type one telephone system. We are privileged to be alive, to see the birth of a type one telephone system. So as you can see, though we are on the verge of becoming a type one civilization, we still have a long road to travel before we will truly understand science. But there are a few things we do know. The first law of thermodynamics, also known as the law of conservation of energy, states that energy is neither created nor destroyed. All energy that exists in the universe has existed from the beginning, and will exist until the end. Most people learned in grade school that our bodies are powered by, and hold energy. This energy is constantly restored by the freely flowing electrons that our bodies obtain from chemicals such as oxygen, sodium, potassium, and calcium. Anyone who's ever shuffled across a carpet in their slippers to shock their little sister has, whether they realized it or not scientifically verified that our bodies retain an electrical charge. Since we know energy is never destroyed, we know that the energy which powers our bodies does not cease to exist either. The real question at this point is, what is consciousness, and do we retain it with our energy after death? In a report by Collective Evolution, quantum physicists discovered that physical atoms are made up of vortices of energy that are constantly spinning and vibrating. Matter at its tiniest observable level, is energy, and human consciousness is connected to it. Human consciousness can influence its behavior and even restructure it. It's important to quickly discuss dimensions, or more specifically, the fact that the mainstream science community is now acknowledging their existence. We are third dimensional beings that currently live in the fourth dimension which consists of longitude, latitude and altitude. In other words, length, width, and depth slash height.
When you add time to these three dimensions, this gives us the four dimensions we currently exist in. This also means we can only see things in 3D or lower, which is why we are unable to simply peer into the fifth and higher dimensions, of which scientists claim there are as many as 11. Some say as many as 21. All physical objects, even me and my chair, exist in three dimensions. Everything has a width, and a height, and a length. But there is another kind of length, a length in time. While a human may survive for 80 years, these stones will last much longer, for thousands of years. And the solar system will last for billions of years. Everything has a length in time as well as space. Traveling in time means traveling through this fourth dimension. Dr. Robert Lanza, one of the most prominent scientists in the field of stem cell biology, and one of time's 100 most influential people, claims quantum theory proves that death does not exist. That it is an illusion that arises in the minds of people, because they identify themselves with their bodies, and that consciousness exists outside of the constraints of time and space. Biocentrism uh, is turning the world upside down again, with the seemingly simple idea that the universe arises from life, not the other way around. So switching the perspective of the universe from physics to biology undoes everything we know about uh, the universe and, and life in it. We think that life is just an accident of physics, but a long list of experiments suggests exactly the opposite. Amazingly, if you add life and consciousness to the equation, you can explain some of the biggest puzzles in science. For instance, it becomes clear why space and time, indeed the properties of matter themselves, depend on the observer. It also becomes clear why the laws of the universe itself are fine-tuned for the existence of life. So until we recognize the universe in our head, attempts to understand the world uh, will remain a road to nowhere. So consider everything around you right now. Me up here at the podium, your hands, your body. Language and custom all say that that's outside us in the external world. But you can't see anything through the vault of bone surrounding your brain. <clears throat> everything you see and experience right now, your body, the walls, the ceilings of this room, are active, an active process that's occurring in your mind. Bottom line is, and the first principle of biocentrism is, is that is that reality involves your consciousness. It could not be there without, without your consciousness. Emerson once said, we have learned that we do not see directly, but immediately, and that we have no means for correcting the colored and distorted lenses which we are, or of computing the amount of their errors. Perhaps these subjective lenses have a creative power. Perhaps there are no objects. So why is everyone surprised at the experimental findings of quantum theory? It's because we're still operating in a severely outdated paradigm. We still believe there's an external world that exists independent of the perceiving subject. So philosophers and physicists from Plato to Hawking have debated this. Niels Bohr, the great Nobel physicist, uh, once said, not so. When we're measuring something, we're forcing an undetermined, undefined world to assume an experimental value. We're not measuring the world, we're creating it. And this is from a physicist. And at the legendary debates, Einstein presented ingenious uh, ideas supporting the idea of a real world out there. But Bohr shot every one of them down one by one and gradually convinced his colleagues uh, of his point of view. Uh, today, however, most people still believe there's a, a, an external world out there. According to Lanza, our consciousness moves to another universe, or dimension, upon death. And this does make a bit of sense when one considers the quantum double-slit experiment in which scientists found that, as mentioned previously, consciousness can shape the nature of physical reality. With every century, our understanding of the world around us continues to expand. At one point, we thought the world was flat, and to state otherwise was considered blasphemy by the church. We look at some of our ancient ancestors' primitive traditions, from worshipping the sun, to sacrifices, and we thank God we live in a modern, developed society where people are now rational and intelligent. And yet, we are still torturing, 
raping, and murdering each other in the names of multiple true gods who are meant to represent kindness and love. Spirituality can exist without religion, and religion does not need to exist for there to be a life after death. Thankfully, with our current advancements in quantum physics, science is proving this for us. To see a full transcript of this report, and for a list of sources, please visit www.anonymous-news.com. We are anonymous. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us.